Is this on? This is on, right? Yeah, this is, this is bad because um, I am not a multitasker, and that, that includes not having the ability to have hands do two different things, which includes holding a microphone. So bear with me as, as, I, as I do that. Thank you all. Uh, our advisory council members, our friends, our students, our faculty, our alumni, our donors, thank you, thank you so much for coming out uh, today. Uh, you all will be hearing very soon, um, you know, from President Hartzell, I guess in a couple of hours, uh, when the university kicks off uh, its largest ever capital campaign. And the role that so many of you have played already, and the role that some of you will be playing, uh, will be a key part of how we think about the future of our school uh, moving forward from this. Uh, for those of you in the advisory council, we just started talking a little bit about that today. There's so much more to keep talking about. Um, what you should know is that while the public phase of the capital campaign kicks off, I believe around maybe 425, somewhere around that time this afternoon, uh, it's been in a silent phase uh, for quite some time. Uh, Luke, his team, Garrett, Rebecca, um, have been working so hard for how many years now in the silent phase? Five years in the silent phase. Uh, not so silent, but five years in that phase uh, to raise funds for the school for so many different things. And we have had stunning success uh, in, in that time period. We've already raised, uh, we're expected to raise throughout the capital campaign $30 million for the school. Uh, we've already raised $19 million. Of it. So we've had, uh, and again, so many of you here have been such a key piece uh, of how we've done that. But let me just sort of share with you um, a few of the details here. And, and Luke, you know Luke, gave me five pages of details. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go through all the details so we get the salient points so you, we can get right to our program on this. So the $19 million we've raised so far has come from hundreds upon hundreds of donors with gifts ranging from, from $10 to $5 million. Uh, every one of those counts. Every single one of those counts. Uh, you know, we have gifts, uh, large gifts such as what we had from Sinclair Black, which allowed us to transform and build our urban design program. But the small gifts have been absolutely instrumental. And for, for example, as many of you know on the advisory council, for helping us facilitate some of the technology needs that we've needed for our students, to supply supplies for our students. All of those gifts add up. Every single one of them matters, and, and we could not be more grateful for that. In this time period, we have already created 21 new endowments. Endowments matter quite a bit because an endowment pays forward in perpetuity. Once an endowment is established, we don't have to worry so much about the swings and the vicissitudes of what's happening in the world around us. We know that year after year, we can turn to that income that allow us to sort of continue to do the things the endowment was set out to do. Uh, yes, it's somewhat impacted by how the stock market goes up and down, but it will still be there uh, for us 20 years from now, 30 years from now, um, long after some of us will no longer be around uh, on that. But that's the, the thing, the, how important it is for enduring support uh, of the school. Uh, within that, uh, we have three new endowed chairs, uh, the Nancy Qualick chair, the Sinclair Black chair, the Dick Clark chair. Uh, and so, um, you know, these are things that just, that, that was just sort of a key part of the chair. We talked also today, many of you heard us talk about uh, the new John S. Chase uh, professorship in architecture, which we're incredibly excited about. Uh, many of you have already seen many news articles about it. It's gotten a great deal of national attention. And part of the wonderful thing about the John Chase gift uh, from the family is that it, it, every gift we get, we want to sort of be able to multiply its impact. So it's a gift that not only establishes a professorship, uh, but in the, the 
the scholarship that comes with it for the HBCUs, it means we're also sort of giving to that next generation and supporting the work of HBCUs, who we really wish to become partners with in, in many more ways. Um, we've also received 15 new scholarships, uh, graduate fellowships, travel funds, and just this week, uh, we received gifts to establish a new graduate fellowship in landscape architecture. Um, you know, because our alumni base is mostly architecture, most of our gifts heretofore have been in architecture. Uh, Sinclair was a key piece of sort of shifting uh, in terms of supporting urban design. We're thrilled to get this, uh, this gift in landscape architecture. Hope Hasbrook could not be happier, uh, if you all know Hope. Uh, we also really want to start focusing on community and regional planning and making sure that we're drawing in gifts uh, for community and regional planning on this. Um, you know, we're going to continue in this vein. Uh, what we've been able to do to... I wish I was there. Yep. <laughs> uh, what we're going to be able to do to support uh, our students, this has been critical for us. And I know that you all are as aware of this as, as we are, uh, even though the university has, has kept tuition costs down, you know, we're a public university, they're still not low. And then on top of it, the, the housing costs in Austin are going through the roof. So we've got a lot to do. Uh, I don't know, should we enjoy letting them come through here? <laughs> Uh, these are students. Sure. Hey, let them come through here. Go ahead and come through here. Because we, we actually kind of want to know what you guys have been doing. Tell us what you've been up to. <laughs> Michael, is this your class? T t I'm sorry. It's the, it's the Broken Kites Club. <laughs> <laughs> you picked the perfect windy day yeah, for this. Yeah. Well, just a few words. <laughs> um, now I've lost my complete train of thought here <laughs> on this. But anyway, continuing to support our students, this is always going to be the, the, the most important focus uh, that we have. But as we also talked about this morning, what we can do in terms of research, uh, many people don't realize the value of what we do, the importance of what we do. Uh, we just heard from Alan Shearer talking about our understanding of the city infrastructure in terms of what is happening now in Ukraine. The, the very knowledge that we bring to the table is extraordinary in understanding these very complex, very complex environments, infrastructures, situations that we have in the environment. Uh, Alan is director of our Center for Sustainable Development. Um, we are so lucky to have the Center for Sustainable Development. Very few schools of architecture have the ability to do in-house research. They often have to partner, often with engineering. Sometimes uh, there will be a university branch that supports that. We have our own research arm, and if you can imagine this, I mean, what school of architecture in the entire world has a research arm that not only facilitates small grants working with certain neighborhoods in the city and NATO? I mean. <laughs> It, the, the, the reach of this, uh, of this, uh, of the Center for Sustainable Development is stunning. Its capability is stunning, and so uh, they they have managed so far on grant money for us to be able to sort of build more capacity there for the way that we can we can start to bring that research that that they have been doing into even more areas, not only for our faculty but to be able to engage more of our students in the kind of groundbreaking research that they will be part of the future, part of shaping the future on. Um, we are, as well, as you know, you love our buildings. We love our buildings. You also know they're a little old. They're a little aged, and they're a little worn. Uh, we started by trying to uh, renovate, update uh, a bit at a time. We're continuing on that path. We got a lot to do. Uh, we, we were hope, hoping to have our new studio, our studio of the future, uh, unveiled in time for, for today. Uh, I think there's a problem with the brackets. 
but it's getting close. It, it's getting very close there, but we've been working a bit at a time. Uh, we've been able to get funding from the university to buy all new furniture. Yay. All new furniture. Uh, so we're, we're starting to sort of piecemeal our ways away because we love these buildings. We want to preserve these buildings, uh, and we want to stay in these buildings. This is just my day. This is just my day. <laughs> All I can say is it's just my day here. Um, uh, we're, we're also sort of looking specifically at bringing two new areas uh, into play. Uh, one of the things that we've all talked about has been this sort of incredible community that you have at a school of architecture. You have this school of architecture that you do not have in many other places, not in many other degrees, not in many other locations. But there is something about this family uh, and, and the way that we communicate and the way that we collaborate that is so rich. Um, that, that is so meaningful and that is so important. So we're looking to build a commons, an idea of a commons. Yes, it'll have a coffee machine, but an idea of a commons uh, where we might have pop-up talks, where there might be uh, groups that get together to converse, where student groups can come together and meet, and where we just sort of hang out and have coffee. coffee. So we're looking to do a commons. Uh, the idea is actually we're thinking about the uh, the Halbox Athenaeum, which has a spectacular Charles Moore mural, what that might be like with its beautiful balconies, an opportunity uh, for the entire school to have this place uh, where they can just sort of come and hopefully not have an assignment to do uh, within that. Uh, we are also, because so much of the work we, we do does involve the hand, you know, we're fully digital uh, and we're advanced digitally, but the hand comes into play in many ways. And so, as you know, uh, there's often concrete being poured on our on our uh, porch. Let me let me get my direction right. There, yeah, on our porch over there. Uh, the, uh, I think in another week or two, the interior design students uh, will be uh, casting uh, tiles, designing tiles uh, there. I'm 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 going to join them for that. Um, we want to build a design build pavilion. So a design build pavilion uh, that will enable us to actually have even more engagement, more engagement with the kinds of sort of work that does not sort of like facilitate or is, is done very well in, in, uh, in interior spaces on that. And, and also to, to facilitate um, our design build projects that Coleman Coker does, uh, where we do sort of the basic construction and, and move out for there. It would be the sort of the perfect place to get that kind of hands-on experience. Um, Luke, <laughs> I've lost track of my notes. Um, <laughs> am I, because I, I, my, see, look, this is how the pages are looking right now. Um, I think it, you've covered all the high points, okay, so I've introduce covered all. The high points. All right, so let, let's, let's move into this. I said not, not multitasking. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to start moving Larry Speck toward the stage. Start moving Stefan and Tammy up to the stage. Oh, no, no, not yet. Am I wrong? Yes. There's something yes. else. Doesn't no, something else not. happen? Doesn't a video oh, happen? Oh, there's a video. We'll show the video at the end. Okay. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's do that. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, I already, I already messed up. Um, there is going to be a video at some point. But everybody here uh, knows Larry Speck. He's the W.L. Moody Jr. Centennial Professor of Architecture, fellow of the UT System Academy of Distinguished Teachers, recipient of the ACSA Topaz Medallion. Uh, those of you who follow that, that is the, the highest teaching award uh, that we have in the country, not just for UT, but in the, in the country. Um, and a fellow of the AIA, he was a former dean, uh, he's been very generous not to advise me too often on that. And cameo star in the video. So now you're going to sort of be waiting, waiting for that video. Uh, two outstanding architecture students, Stefan Britz. Uh, he's going to be graduating with a Master of Architecture in May. Yes, on board. Yes. OK. Uh, he's from South Africa. And he represented South Africa in track and field in the 2016 Summer Olympics. 
um, studied graduate level chemistry at Florida State before he came here. And I hope you're happy here, right? Very. <laughs> okay, important. And then Timmy. Osanian Tolu. <laughs> if, if you've heard me saying Ross's name for the last two days, and I finally, she finally gave me a, a trick to say her name. Um, she, I've known uh, Temi since you arrived. She's now a fourth year BRC student, born in Nigeria, grew up in Houston, an active student leader and volunteer. Uh, she was president of her undergraduate architecture student council in 2020, 2021. I, I cannot begin to tell you how incredible it was to work with, with Temi and her role there and the leadership she provided for the students, but also for those who, who followed her in that role. Um, some of you might recognize her and, and her name because she won the 2022 Robert L. Wesley Award from the SOM Foundation. And she just, uh, recently returned from, you did, well, you did PRP in Copenhagen or did you do a study abroad? study abroad? A study abroad in Copenhagen. So please welcome Larry, Stefan, and Temi. Uh, so this is the caliber student that uh, I can remember Bibi Dykema being. I can remember <laughs> Nestor Bottino being. <laughs> Uh, I can remember Elaine Molinar being, uh, I can remember David Harrison being. This is the caliber student we're talking about. Uh, so they're really, uh, I think, destined for great things in the future. And uh, I am not talking uh, here. I am just moderating, and I'm going to let you just hear from uh, these two amazing people uh, for the whole time. So I've got a few questions, and uh, I'm just going to let... Uh, uh, Stefan and Timmy uh, take it from here. So uh, Michelle was talking about a sense of community in the school, and that's always been, from my point of view, one of the coolest things about this place is just a real, um, you know, camaraderie um, and mentorship. So I wonder if I could get each of you to talk for a minute here about have you had any mentors in the school, and uh, maybe faculty, staff, students, whatever but someone you really learned from. Mm, just give me a little outline of that. Um, yes, uh, so I'll say that I've had a lot of faculty that have helped me along my way, um, but I really wanted to take the time and opportunity to talk about a student that I feel has been a great mentor to me. Um, Haley Algo was um, a student here. She graduated this last semester, um, and she's been the person who I think called me to take a leadership role in so many ways, um, has been able to point me to excellent members of our faculty and staff who have been able to assist me in finding resources and finding opportunities that I've been able to get um, while being a student here. And then she's also grown to just be a really great friend. Um, so I think those are the kind of connections that you're able to build here as a student, not just to have a very supportive staff and faculty and teachers, but also a very supportive peer network as well. Excellent. Stefan. Yeah, um, mine is a little bit more directed towards the faculty and some of the bonds that I've made with uh, some of our teachers and our faculty and people like Danelle Briscoe. It's one of those that, you know, after you don't really know what you're learning while you're going, you kind of no, don't know what you're doing and you're trying a whole bunch of things. And then once you move on to the next semester, you start to realize how much the previous semester meant to you and things that you've learned. And uh, people like Coleman Coker, um, you know, just look at architecture in a little bit of different way. Um, try to step back and say, hey, what, what are we really looking at, at, at here? What type of architect do I want to be? And pe people like that have definitely helped me tremendously and, and have been with me along the way. Cool. So uh, that's in the kind of mentorship role. But uh, tell me a little bit maybe about just colleagues, just friends, just peers, and uh, how they might have affected your time here. Uh, yeah, so continuing, I think it's kind of the same vein of question, but I'm saying how much your peers mean to you here at the school, and I think I've been able to 
have people who I've been in studios with become really good friends and lifelong friends that I can see moving on with me. Um, people that I've been, just happen to be in the same studio with semester after semester, as unlikely as that seems. Um, and we get to do a lot of collaborative work in our studios. So you get to gain really good bonds with the people in your studio, the people you work with, and there's a lot of camaraderie um, at this school, whereas I think some other schools have more competition. Um, this school is really um, encouraging everyone to be able to work at their best and really learn from each other, not just from our faculty and staff. Um, I've, I've been a teaching assistant here for a while, and um, I've been teaching with um, Joyce Rosner and Elizabeth Danzi. And it's been quite a ride for us uh, teaching before COVID hit. Uh, being all in person and having to deal with those type of um, possibilities and Thon here was one of our students, see him looking. Um, but that, that's been something that I would probably take with me for forever and I would come back and we would, we would talk about those things and things that we had to change, look at some of the assignments, what can we make to make this better um, and so on. That's really cool. Cool to hear Timmy talk about a mentor that's a student and cool to hear Stefan talk about uh, just a colleague, but happens to be faculty members. And I think that, that blending is really a cool thing. Uh, so I was wondering also um, what impact uh, being in Austin might have had for your architectural education. Do you think it's uh, been consequential that you're in a really growing, really dynamic uh, city? Uh, and how might that have affected your view on architecture? Yeah, so I think for me, um, Austin comes up a lot in our work as just a site for a lot of our studio projects. And I think as a growing city that is encountering a lot of new issues, we're able to bring those issues into our work and it's become kind of a really good case study, not to just live here, but to get to study things about the city as well. And I think uh, being able to be here and look at the city through that lens, I'm able to go to other places and be just as analytical and analyze those things as well. So I think it really works and it's really been impactful to it be the setting of my learning and education because um, it's allowed me to grow and look at things from a new lens as well. Cool. I think the biggest difference to me is the access to natural landscape. You know, we have the creek that runs through, we have the beautiful river, um, we have all these parks, and seeing how the people live differently and how they connect going out on weekends or going out for walks, that's to me is much different than where I lived before. And knowing that and what architecture could do and, and some of the problems that we can look at in how we design for the future, I think is really, really interesting. Excellent. So I wonder if uh, each of you could talk about one class that might stick in your head as that really had an impact on the way I do architecture, or I think about architecture. Uh, what, what was the one class that maybe sticks out in your head? Sure, so um, as part of our like requirements for our degree plan, we have to take um, a topics course. Um, I think a few of them. And the one that I had chosen to take maybe last year, I think it was now, was Willa Granger who, um, got her PhD here at the school. She taught a course called Constructing Age, and it was looking at how we design for different age groups or how architecture affects different age groups. And I think it was a topic that I hadn't really encountered or talked about in any of my other courses. And it was kind of the first like really eye-opening class that made me look at things in a lot of different ways. Um, and as I've been able to travel to so many different places in the last couple of years, I've been able to look at things around me and think, oh my gosh, I want to send this to Willa so, so we can talk about it and think about how it related to the things we learned in class. And I think that's something that not a lot of classes do um, to where they impact you beyond just the limits of that class and you're wanting to discuss those topics outside of the classroom, not just for the grade. Um, so yeah, and I think there are so many classes like that here at the school um, that I've been fortunate to take? Mine's been um, one of our electives with Vince Snyder. Um, it's called Design Logics, um, Proportion and Projection, and uh, looking at how you know, these different approaches to, to design back in the Renaissance period 
in, in what they did and in, in, in how they approached design problems and how we can still learn from how things was, were being done um, back then to how we can still design now. And uh, that, that definitely has opened up my eyes um, when I look at a new design problem. Cool. Um, so uh, I want to shift gears here maybe a little bit and uh, talk about um, maybe a little harder things to talk about. Uh, so I want to know how finances have worked for you. How have you paid for your architectural education? Uh, what, are, what have been the, the resources that you had and the resources that you were able to, to tap for that? Yeah, so um, obviously finances are not everyone's favorite topic to talk about, um, but being able to get kind of a world-class education and not have to worry too much about what my tuition cost is going to be that year because we have so many resources here at the school that I've been able to tap into. Um, we get a lot of emails giving us access to um, scholarships that are coming around that have fallen in the laps of our faculty and staff. Um, we have a scholarship program um, where students are able to apply every year and get connected with scholarships that they can access um, for the following school semester. And I feel like being able to tap into those resources has really eased um, a lot of the financial burden of being able to gain this education. And I think those things have also made it even more worthwhile when we're able to access so many different opportunities that a lot of schools don't get to have. Um, so yeah, I definitely think coming to the school is worth it despite having some like financial burden, but it's definitely eased by the steps the school takes to help its students um, overcome, overcome those burdens. Um, I mentioned that I serving as uh, one of the teaching assistants, but I think there's so many um, possibilities and available positions at the school that's very unique um, compared to other schools that allows a graduate student um, to fund their um, studies and also you get a small stipend in uh, that, that you can pay for your everyday day-to-day -day life. But I've also been very fortunate um, with the possibilities and opportunities that there are um, for scholarships. And uh, some of those have helped me as well, you know, paying for uh, some of our computers that we have to buy and some of the software that we have to gain. And um, that's been, you know, maybe one of the most positive things for me um, being at the school and knowing that I'm in a field of architecture, right, which is much different than going um, to a medical school or um, to become a lawyer. Um, but knowing that when you get out of school, um, it's much different um, out there um, than those different degrees. So having those things available um, to pay for your studies is, is just um, absolutely fabulous. It's good. So I'm, now I'm going to really uh, get down to brass tacks. And uh, uh, so I want to know what your debt situation is. Uh, are you going to graduate with, uh, with debt, or are you going to be able to be debt free? So how did that go so far? Um, uh, I will be graduating with debt, <laughs> um, unfortunately. But this kind of goes back to the previous sec um, question. I feel like I've been able to access a lot of resources and funding that have lessened that burden. Um, and I'm not concerned about being able to pay it off once I graduate. Um, that being said, I think UT, the School of Architecture, has a lot of career connections. I'm not very concerned about finding a job afterwards either, because I know I'll be able to be well connected. Um, and I am able to have a very competitive resume and portfolio because of the education that I've gained here. So I think all those factors really contribute to putting me at ease financially um, and being able to be certain about not having to worry about my future, if that makes sense. Re really well said. Um, I've been fortunate enough to come out of school with little to no debt. And that's been largely, or all of it has been thankful to this university. And um, I don't think I could come out with minimal debt if I went to any other school. So I've been fortunate enough um, to have a few, a few scholarships and be a teaching assistant, like I've mentioned before, um, that gives me the opportunity to come out 
with little to no depth. That's really great. So I will tell you that uh, Timmy is someone who, when there is a call out, you know, there's a scholarship thing coming up, uh, who wants to apply for that? I see Robin shaking her head back there. Uh, but uh, so there just was a recent one for Texas Architectural Foundation. And here are some scholarships that are going to be available. And we had 39 applicants for those scholarships. I think there were probably 12 or 13 students that we were able to put up for those. But absolutely, Timmy was on that list. And, uh, and she was one of those we, we certainly put up. Now, I want to let you know that there are, if we put up 12 and there were 39, that's 27 that did not get nominated for the, that's those particular scholarships. And these people are the cream of the crop, and they get a lot more uh, financial support and opportunity because of their performance. Uh, but there are also extremely high-performing students that wouldn't quite have the same uh, experience. And that's really where we're looking to improve that situation so there are more opportunities to get through the program without having a burden of debt that can really hamper your career in those first 10 years out of school, which can be disastrous for some, some people. So enough on finances, we'll, we'll move to something else. Uh, so I want to just uh, have a big open-ended question here of what kind of career do you imagine for yourself, Timmy? What do you think you want to be doing in 10, 15, 20 years? Where are you going? Um, I feel like my answer isn't quite so certain. Um, right now, I think I'm leaning towards a very professional architecture degree. Um, but I think the greatest part of coming here has been able to discover how expansive the architecture profession is. Um, it's not all just people who work in firms all day, every day. Um, there are people who are researching. There are great people who are teaching. There are people who are set designing for very popular films and um, TV shows. And I think we've gotten so much exposure to different sorts of professionals here at the school that's really widened what I think I can do with my degree. And I'm very excited to see where that takes me. Um, but I'm really just letting myself explore my different interests. And that's something the school has given me countless opportunities to do. Um, and that's the greatest part. So we'll see. We'll see where the 10 years gets us. You'll have to ask me then. <laughs> right, OK. Well, Timmy's got a little while to make some decisions, too. You don't have any more time, Stefan. I you, don't. Rubber hits the road. You're graduating, dude. I got to know exactly where I want to be. Go. Um, yeah, this, it's a difficult question. I. I I think, or I don't think, I know I want to be a professional architect and I want to be a licensed architect. But there's more to our field than just being a designer. There are things that need to be said to learn how to run a business, how to be a leader in a firm. So I would love to see myself uh, be part of a larger firm, um, that I have a, a larger voice in that firm, that could lead the people in that firm, and that can know how to run a business as well. So. Excellent. That's really cool. Uh, so I wonder if you guys have any questions you might want to ask of Timmy and Stefan. Okay. Uh, so I think we're going to we'll wrap it up here. I really want to thank these two for taking time out of their Friday afternoon to, uh, to talk with us. And uh, it just gives you a sense of I mean, the thing that keeps all of us here and loving this place is these students. And uh, there's just generation after generation of amazing human beings who come through the school. And uh, yeah, we could have we gotten 40 or 50 uh, examples of Timmy's and Stefan's that, uh, that could have said the same kind of thing. So thank, thank you, too. So video time. I, of course, now that you're done, the music has stopped. It's just, just how it's sort of, 
Uh, apparently, uh, what I hear is they're, they're doing a sound check for the performance tonight. You know, the Black Pumas are playing. So I think they're, that's what they're doing. Maybe they've stopped, but I'm sure as soon as our next panel comes up, they'll, they'll find a way to start up again. Um, and it makes me think, um, I, I know everybody doesn't believe me when I say this, but I'm, I live on Rainy Street. I did not know about Rainy Street when I moved here and before I signed the lease until my first Saturday night. But uh, there is now going on for me uh, almost once a week. There is about 25 drummers, just drummers, that are right below my balcony drumming for hours. So I'm feeling like this is just normal. All, all this is just normal for us. I'm on the 12th floor, but believe me, Believe me, I, it, the, the, free, the free field sound is reflecting off of buildings that he designed and, and you know, coming, coming right in, coming right into to my unit. They do stop at 10. That's what I can say. They at least stop it by 10. Uh, so now we, we had this great chance uh, to hear from Timmy, from Stefan, from Larry to talk about the student experience here. Now I want to start talking about research that's going on here. And so, and of course, this is, all of this means a lot to me, but, but the, the kind of research that we're doing at the school is so impactful. Uh, and just for you all to get a taste of it, you heard a little bit from Alan. Now you get to see how our faculty are leading this with, with their students. Um, you know Miriam. Miriam spoke, I think you spoke, was it in the fall or in the last spring? Last spring, last spring uh, to, to our advisory council. Um, you know, she, she was talking about the work that she was doing with this nonprofit Echo Rise combination with Austin Water. There, there's actually some amazing articles that she's written that just blow your mind away into how looking at something like water infrastructure completely changes the way that you think about equity and you think about the built environment. It just, I'm just always so happy to be in your presence. Uh, she joined us uh, just a few years after working as a planner in San Francisco. Uh, her master's degree in community and regional planning, or uh, they're, they're urban planning, right? Or are they community? They are, okay. And from MIT, doctorate from Berkeley. Uh, her research and teaching interests address race, society, and the built environment. She teaches practicum, research design, core courses in our CRP program, leads right now UTs, the entire university's multidisciplinary research initiative, Planet Texas 2050. She also teaches a course on sports arenas, which I would, I need that invitation to come to, to, come to that class. Uh, she is joined today by Bianca Pizarro Vasquez, uh, Vasquez, Vasquez, a second year community regional planning master's student. Originally from Ponce, Puerto Rico, Bianco in, earned her BA in sociology at the University of Central Florida. Her current research examines the relationship between planning and policing. She's also a graduate research assistant for the Regenerative and Equitable Cities flagship project through the Planet Texas 2050 initiative and is writing an article about circular green infrastructure through an environmental justice lens. I think this also relates a little bit to some of the larger initiatives that we were talking about today. Uh, she has been an active volunteer here in Austin, assisting in the community partnered academic discussion around resilience hubs. She has plans on exploring alternative planning education efforts through interdisciplinary community partnerships. Miriam and Bianca. It's, oh. oh good, yes, I think you should. It's so nice to be here and reconnect with some of you. I was so pleased when a couple of you recognized me um, from my visit with you all last spring. Um, it was such a treat for me because one of the theories actually that I work with Let's in my start. research is, uh, I like the music video effect, and I, if the, if the music comes on over by the tower, I, I, will, I can make the most of it. Um, I, you know, one of the theories I work with is this idea that schools are communities, right? So there, there are the people you see in the hallways, um, in the offices, critical anchors 
to what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, but actually it's the larger community that breathes life into that community and brings in new ideas, keeps it going in multiple ways, including resources. Um, and that's actually one of the things bringing us here together today. Um, so it's, it's really nice for me to be able to meet people from the larger UTSOA community. Um, and so I'm actually, I am going to go over a couple of research projects that I'm involved in. Um, to give you a sense of what research is, what it looks like for some of us faculty, what it means on a daily basis, what some of its implications are. Um, and then I'm going to ask Bianca, one of our star planning students, to talk about what this means for students. Because as faculty, we, we love putting our research out there and often get all the credit. Um, but it's actually very important for us, a lot of... Um, it's important for us UTSOA faculty, um, and I do think it's a, it's a unique value we hold relative to some other schools um, to get students involved in research, and to give them important roles um, in ways that um, they're, they're building their own skills and their outlook um, on how they think about the world and how they want to take that information um, beyond the program. So I do have a couple of images. I don't know if they're up. Um, I can't tell. Okay, good. So. I'm going to talk about three research projects that I'm involved with, um, two of which I lead, and one that I'm very fortunate to be a part of. Bianca and I are both a part of it. Um, and a couple of you may be familiar with it already, EcoRise. Um, our partnership with the local environmental education organization started three years ago as a pilot project at a local high school involving six youth. In the past two years, we got a U.S. Um, NOAA grant for $450,000 to expand that. And this project is exciting because we're looking at questions of diversity, which many of us, as I understand, are very interested in. We're thinking about how green jobs, green career pa pathways can actually be very exclusive and marginalize youth of color along the way. So we're looking at how K through 12 education fits into this idea of green career pathways. And we're looking at how to expand those pathways and make them more inclusive. One of the ways we're doing that is by introducing youth to lead curriculum. Um, and so they're getting this, old, uh, this greater exposure, but we're actually also asking them, what do you think about the built environment? And how does uh, your green school, um, and they're engaging in these tours um, and these hands-on experiences, does it, is it green enough to you? What is this design missing? Um, and one of the findings of this research um, is that youth are actually very interested in how students operate within the high school context. Um, how segregation might happen within a school building, and how to reorient and rethink how students interact, and how green building can facilitate that. Um, and so a very, this is a, a very relevant policy discussion for a lot of school districts that are seeking to um, further green their schools um, through various bond programs and other infrastructure programs. Another project that I'm leading is on boil water notices. Boil water notices are on the rise across the country, not just Texas, not just Austin. I know this has been kind of a shock in recent years, as many of us have experienced um, boil water notices for the first time. I experienced it for the first time. I had actually just moved to Austin three years prior to that uh, more extensive and severe one we, ex uh, we three months prior to the more uh, extensive one we experienced, I believe it's 2018. Um, I conducted focus groups um, with UT students to see, to learn how they experience the boil water notice and what they think a large institution can do differently in future events. Um, and one of the findings from this particular project is the ongoing role of environmental education in the operations of water utilities. Um, and and there's, a, there's certainly a larger push for water utilities to be more mindful of how they engage residents on an ongoing basis and not just at the point of paying a water bill, um, which is now mostly digital um, and, and presents its own challenges. And then another project that I'm very fortunate um, to be a part of is led by our in-house economist, Michael Oden in Community and Regional Planning. 
And we are working on a green job study. So what is green jobs? Austin is known as a relatively green city. The city itself has set very, very ambitious climate action goals. What are green jobs? What are the projections for future green job growth? And my role in that project in particular is looking at the equity implications of that. Who is being left out of those professions, again, and how do we make them more inclusive so that they better reflect the priorities and concerns of communities? So I've talked a little bit about my research projects, but I think an equally important conversation, I appreciate your patience, Bianca, is the role that students play in this research. Um, as faculty members, we work very hard to get our research funded. The three projects that I've talked about today um, probably involve about $510,000 worth of research. And I've, I've hired about five to six students with that. And I should note that, that those funds pay for a lot of different things. Um, Amazon gift cards for focus group participants, research software, collaborator time, um, but very importantly, one of my greatest joys is hiring students um, and working with them to improve our project management skills, um, to think about how this research is at the cutting edge of what we know about the topic and how we might be called on in the future as a result of our research findings to inform um, how this topic is talk talked about in a more public way. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, turn it to Bianca and also ask a few questions. Um, and I, Bianca, if you can please talk about some of the projects you're involved in, your specific role, and how this shapes your time here at the School of Architecture. For sure. Thank you so much, Miriam. It is such an honor to be in your presence and learn from you and be your peer in a way and work in these types of projects that are so important, not just for right now, but for the future, hopefully that comes. Um, and we are that future. So that's awesome to also meet today um, other students, undergraduate student, graduate student, um, that are not in the community and regional planning program that look at similar design questions but approach them in different ways and so it's super important to converse with them and see their work and be in their presence as well. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of background quickly into how it is that I ended up in research in community and regional planning with a sociology background. And I, as Miriam also was, were form, formal McNair scholars, um, and that essentially is just a federal program, education, federal education program that's helping um, low-income, underrepresented, first-generation students get to graduate degrees, at least supposed to be PhD, but hey, we can't always all get there. Um, so I'm here, and I was a former McNair scholar, and that was kind of my introduction to research, and I was immersed in a community of all kinds of different research minds and from bio, like biology, science, chemistry, um, from all quarters of the world, was able to interact with them, was able to inspire in my heart a desire to know more, and so with that, I came to the School of Architecture. And I arrived with a McNair Fellowship. So the, the graduate school, um, I won. I don't know how I did that, but I did it. And I'm, I was here for my first year, thankfully, new to Texas. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I did my time in Florida. I'm doing my time in Texas. And in a great way, guys. No, no, no offense. I really, it's really grown on me. And, <laughs> sorry. and so I, yeah, I came with a fellowship and I was able to really immerse myself in my classes and learn what planning is. I came with very limited knowledge to what it was, but only knowing that I wanted to make whatever, our built environment a better place for absolutely every person that exists. And so the summer between my first and second year, I was extremely stressed as to how I was gonna pay for my degree. I am, I come from a working class background. I come from a colonized place. And so it's all very difficult to manage in these very professional settings. So thankfully I emailed every professor I knew saying, please, I don't care what project, I need help, please. And the fabulous Catherine Liebernick replied to me, fear not, 
that, I got you. And she didn't say that, but that is my paraphrasing of her. And I was able to end up in the initiative that is so amazing, that Miriam is a part of, that so many of my colleagues and faculty are a part of, which is Planet Texas 2050. And so Planet Texas 2050 is just a, um, an initiative to think of how we can explore the future in more sustainable and equitable ways. And so I ended up in this project with so much joy to be able to live another year in Austin and pay for my education, which I value so much, and was able to join Miriam in practicum this year um, with the ease of knowing that I could pay my rent. Um, and so that I mentioned that just so you know how important it is for us students, us um, students of color, how difficult it can be to navigate these professional spaces. And so that was one of that's one of the projects I'm working on. I'm, I'm writing an article about green infrastructure, circular approaches to green infrastructure, but specifically looking at environmental justice and considering environmental justice as something that is important. And so the project essentially is going to be informing the resilience hubs here in Austin. And so we have multiple um, faculty from different places that are looking into different systems like housing, transportation, energy, food systems, and how it all relates into creating a space for community to come during a time of need, which could be a disaster, but it could be something different. You know, we were living in an unprecedented times, and so having those spaces to come to as community are super important, and that's the work we're supposed to be um, contributing to. Also, in practicum, we're doing the Green Jobs and Workforce Development uh, Study, which has been so exciting as a student to be a part of, because last semester, we were just getting to know what the situation here in Austin was regarding green jobs, you know, we are a green city, but are we employing our workforce in those jobs? Like, what is it getting in the way of the people who are Austinites, call Austin home? Um, not necessarily those who are just coming in, but those who have dedicated their lives to this place. Um, how are we making sure that they have a, a job or security to continue that work? And so, it's been really en enlightening to be learning about alternative research methodologies. We, we read a text called Place in Research that really highlighted so many ways that we can do research in outside of a box that you would like that you put research in. And one of those is photo voice. And so we're doing photo voice in our practicum right now, which essentially is a way for people to tell their story in a, in through their own eyes. And so there is something in our readings that I really liked that I wanted to share with you guys. Stories shape how we behave and respond to other people or beliefs. And so essentially what we do as researchers, we're, we're storytellers. Whether you're quantitative, qualitative, you're just sharing an experience that might be different from your own. And so with photo voice, we're able to do that through art. And not just photo voice, I happen to be in the group that we're doing an environmental protection agency video challenge. So we're not just taking photo voice, which is reaching our research community, but we're taking what we're learning from them and we're sharing it with everybody else because this isn't just an issue that applies to Austin, it's an issue that applies to every place in, in this world as we look toward green and just futures. So it's been super exciting to become a videographer, director, and participant of video um, all in one semester. I was just as, at the Austin History Center for the first time, looking through the archives and you know, getting to know the real history of this place and the, real, the realness of what makes Austin weird. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just a little bit of, of my research experience in other, other projects. So. And as part of that, I think you started to hint at this, what are some of the skills, applied skills that as a graduate student you're learning that you think may be helpful to you in, as you move forward? Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely one of the biggest ones that I'd say doesn't relate necessarily to research, but has shaped me like so much since getting to graduate school has been the concept of advocacy or the skill of being an advocate, um, not just for myself, but for people like my roommate. She's an international graduate student, and I was able to help her get a GRA position as well so she can be at ease in her 
own position as an, you know, there's, there's different levels to this as well. So advocacy um, for myself as well, what do I want to be as a planner? What do I want the planning field to be? What do I want design to look like? And so all of that obviously brings me to leadership and being able to lead those people in those conversations or in these projects or in a direction. And then I'd say, above all, curiosity. Um, curiosity to know more, curiosity to do things differently, curiosity to step outside what is comfortable and what is considered planning even or considered design even. And so those questionings and that kind of rubble rousing a little bit, um, those have been, I think, some of the skills outside of just like the very technical skills of videography, transcribing, directing, translating, like all of those different things. I think those three are the most important to me at least. Which reminds me that, um, so I really appreciate that note on the curiosity because I think that a lot of us as faculty also think a lot about critical thinking, right? We're in applied fields. And um, some, that, that gives us a huge opportunity to be engaged. Um, but if we're not using critical thinking, which is a learned skill, um, then we're going to come up short on what's possible. Um, and so I, I appreciate that particular reflection. I have one more. So how do you think these experiences are um, prompting, you, prompting you to think differently? Um, or how are they prompting you to think about what your next steps are? So, what are my next steps? I, as a, as a former McNair scholar, the expectation is for me to go get my PhD, and that is something that I would love because I was born to learn. That's not my fault. And I think, though, that because of that, I rec the recognition of the fact that I do want to at least be in relationship with people that involves some type of transfer of knowledge, whether it's from that person to me or myself to the other person, um, leads me to want to explore what would it look like for everybody to have planning capacity, design capacity, um, design knowledge, planning knowledge, and, and use it in their own lives to better their situation as now planners of their own every day, if that makes sense. And so I'd love to, in some way, partner here in Austin or in other places with, with organizations like Community Powered Workshop who are doing the, the academic and community work to help people design their own environments and design an environment that reflects their own experience um, and their experience of those they know. So the, I would love to go into, into some type of research field or remain in, in the exchange of ideas of what, it, of what planning is, what planning was, and what it could be. And so that's not putting myself in a box, but rather entering into a, a lifelong project with my peers to, to see what that would look like and what that means, whether it's inside of the university, outside of the university, or within the, the community more broadly. So thank you. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, everyone, for having us. All right, we got one more panel. Uh, but before we launch into this panel, uh, you, you know that we use Sinclair Black's name in vain all the time. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he's a professor emeritus. He taught here. It's easier to say 101 semesters. He taught 101 semesters. He's also a former acting dean, so he also has advice for me. Lots of people here have advice for me uh, on being a dean. Uh, he, as you know, I talked about this already, he completely changed our urban design program here. Uh, dean Almy, uh, Simon Atkinson, Sinclair when he was here, uh, you know, had worked for so many years doing yeoman's work, you know, trying to build this urban design program. But when this gift from Sinclair came in, the opportunity to provide fellowships, uh, graduate fellowships to bring students in the program, uh, the opportunity to bring in uh, partner professorships, uh, a partnership that we have with Gell right now, uh, the opportunity 
as well to use it to fund graduate research assistants. Um, almost overnight, we saw this dramatic uh, change in the program, you know, built, built on really the strong work that had taken place for so many years, but it just blossomed. It blossomed in terms of the numbers of students involved, the excitement that the program has, uh, and the reach that the program has. I, the, one of the other things that was sort of the first thing we kicked off for the, the urban design program was actually to hold a symposium where Dean, which Dean ran that, that brought together uh, academic leaders uh, from around the country to come and talk about challenges and the future of urban design. Those are the kind of conversations that we need to have here more often, and it was kicked off in this program. Uh, so we love you, man. We really love you. Uh, and, and, this, this is, and so we're going to move now to talking about uh, urban design. Oh, well, actually, the man deserves a hand. <laughs> so, and a hug. Make, make sure that happens, too, as well. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dean, uh, another Dean, but th that's his name, uh, and, and two students. He is a, a registered architect. He's a Sinclair, Sinclair Black Chair in Architecture. It's one of, one of the, the, the aspects of this is to support Dean in his role. Registered architect, he's one of our own, earned his post-professional Master of Architecture from UT. Uh, he did his undergraduate at Cornell. After teaching at the University of Tennessee, he returned to Austin with a focus on teaching design at the urban level. level. And we know uh, that he is leading our program to new heights. He's brought two students with him, uh, Aparna Ra Rahan or Rajan. Rajan is a master's student in our urban design program from Bangalore, India. We were talking last night uh, about Bangalore. Uh, she's work worked there as an architect. She's also been an assistant professor in India, moved to the US uh, just eight months ago uh, to pursue her graduate studies. She's also chief illustrator and content writer for an urban design magazine called The Urban Rhetoric a biannual publication that was started by, by her and her friends back in India. Um, she's a proud recipient of the Sinclair Black Excellence Scholarship. Uh, major interests lie in the domain of public spaces, their safety and security, and their interactive designs. And her research revolves around the design of self-generative spaces with the help of local communities. And she's seen a couple of projects come, back to, come, li come to life back in her home country of India. Brittany Faulkner is a third year master's candidate in the dual degree program with community and regional planning and urban design. Her studies have focused on using biophilic design to enhance the functionality and resiliency of urban spaces in order to bolster human health and well being. She currently works as a graduate research assistant for the urban design department and outside of academia works for a sustainable development nonprofit based in East Austin. So I am looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Dean Addington, and, and especially thank you, Sinclair Black. Um, a, a brief sort of description of urban design in the school and a little bit about how it got here, um, just really quickly, which is that as, as Michelle suggested, it had, it had always sort of been in the school, but it kind of floated under the surface. And Sinclair for, I'm gonna say 60 years, maybe not quite, and Simon for 40 years almost, and now me for 20 years, um, have been trying to kind of build the profile of urban design within the school, originally not necessarily as a separate discipline but as a lens through which to understand what architecture does, what landscape architecture does, what city and planning, city and region, or here, community and regional planning does. And so urban design's emergence from a kind of subcategory under a master of architecture program into having its own degree and then being able to establish its own actually academic discipline recognized by the graduate school of the university is because of Sinclair. And it, and it is a major shift. And what it allows urban design to do is cut across all the other disciplines in the school. And you've probably heard that from the sort of descriptions of the research that Brittany and Aparna 
have been engaged in. Um, so I want to let them sort of carry the ball, so to speak, but I do think that, you know, uh, Michelle mentioned the conference that we had uh, at the beginning of all of the, the, just before COVID, and we're having another one in the fall at the University of Miami, um, which is the second one. We've kind of delayed it. Um, the idea there is to make a difference, not only in the School of Architecture, with urban design establishing itself as its own sort of discipline, but also nationally. Like we are starting to make an impression at the national level. And having a finalist in the ULI doesn't hurt either. Um, so I really think there's been a lot of transformation. One of the critical f aspects of the urban design program is that it is largely post-professional. So students come here already architects, already landscape architects. If they're neither of those, they can do a dual degree to get professional credentials in planning. So there are many tracks through it, but all of the tracks require someone to go back to the academy on top of the professional credentials they already have. And they do it because they care about the world. And, and that's ultimately the goal. I mean, we all know that, you know, most of the world's population is now living in cities. We know there's incredible growth in urbanization, particularly in the global south, right? All across the world. And what's interesting about the urban design program to me is it brings together students from all across the world. We have students from Latin America, from Asia, from Russia, from, you know, the US, <laughs> um, from India, like, and they come together and they bring an incredible cultural richness. And it allows them as a body to begin to talk about global issues and global problems of how urban design can basically impact future development globally. Because many of these students go back to the countries you know, that they got their original sort of training from or where their home is. Some stay in the United States for a little longer and get additional training. All of these countries have different approaches to the urban environment, different regulatory environments, um, et cetera. And I think the real strength of the program is in the multivalent points of view that the students bring. So with that, I, I actually want to, um, you know, I have, they, they gave me a few talking points. Um, so I'm going to start, and uh, like maybe I'll start with Brittany here. Um, oh, good. Okay. Yes. Why did you come to UT Austin? Oh. <laughs> well, so it's actually very fun. Um, so I moved uh, from Pennsylvania to Texas without like thinking I would ever go back to get a master's degree. I got my undergrad from like the University of Pittsburgh, and I moved down here actually to work for a man named Pliny Fisk, who was doing like a lot of the stuff that like I really wanted to do in my professional career. And he was actually the one who convinced me, like, you need to go to UT. Like, all of the great names of architecture, like, kind of originated here, like, when he came in the 70s to work with, like, all of these people, like, Alan Taniguchi and, like, these very famous, like, big-named people. Um, and I kind of wanted to follow in that legacy as well. Um, and it's been great. You know, I came here um, originally just for CRP, just for planning. Um, and I realized during my first year that, like, it overlaps so much with, like, the urban design program, like, the work that Dean was doing with his students. Um, and so I applied for the dual degree. And it's just nice to be able to kind of mesh the two um, and see where that will take me when I graduate from here as well. And Aparna? Yeah, thanks, Dean. And uh, <laughs> for me, it's been like um, I wanted to get my master's degree. I knew when I graduated from architecture that I want to be abroad. And I want to, you know, expand that knowledge bank. And I know a lot of things that happen in India, but I wanted to learn more and have that global perspective. And I know years kept passing, and I had my own financial constraints. And I was like, OK, now it's COVID. I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, I, I kept working, and I was like, OK, this year I am going to apply and see what happens. And then there's this whole thing about you know, the financial burden. So I was like, 
okay, maybe not this year again. But then I was like, okay, let's take the leap. And then I said, okay, I will talk to Professor Dean. And I started talking to Professor Simon as well. I was like, UT is the place to go for me. And they were so warm and they said, you know, this is the place to be. The curriculum was so uh, vast and um, it was like a bridge between the professional and the academic. Um, it was sort of a blend. And I think that's what drew me here. And um, how have you found, I guess for yourself, how have you found the, the, the student, the mixture of the student's constituency in the urban design program, the diversity? Has that contributed to your sort of understanding of the urban problems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I came here with the thought that, yes, there will be diversity in the program. But luckily, I have five other Indian students with me, which is half the class. But then the, uh, the other half is like, OK, I have a friend who's come from, um, I mean, I have Brittany as my friend. And then, <laughs> and then Victoria, who, who is uh, from Ecuador. She just graduated previous uh, December. So, and I have other friends too. And that diversity, and I didn't even know that there were urban problems from other countries. And I thought, OK, India is filled with a lot of problems. But yeah, that did change my perspective after coming here. And Brittany? Oh. I shouldn't put the mic down, really. Um, yeah, I mean, I when I came here, I never thought that I would have like so many friends from other countries. Um, I'll, just, I'll just be honest there. Because I come from a really small town. Uh, and even like when I went to get my undergrad, it was it wasn't really that culturally diverse, the program that I was in. Um, and being here for three years um, with the planning department and having um, the urban design program be mostly uh, post-professional, like the amount of friends that I've made that are from like all of these different walks of life, like, like friends from India. We have a student who's from Russia who's really talented, who's, who's taught me a lot of things. And it's like the connections that you make here from people who like are very global and I can just like teach you a lot, like not based in America, but like from around the world is, is really valuable and it's really added to the things that I've learned here as well. And how have you found the, I mean, one of the things about the urban design program is actually perhaps the shortest degree <laughs> in the School of Architecture, right? It's really three semesters. It's very short. Students come here for post-professional education. The, the curriculum has to be very compressed and very pointed so that you can, we can make it work in three semesters. Mm -hmm. How have you found that, the, the exposure to opportunities here at the school? Well, I've had a lot, because I've been here for three years, so <laughs> a little longer than three semesters. Um, but I guess just like, like the range of things that changes every year, because the urban design program is go growing so fast, and like, like you just mentioned, and like I kind of hinted to, like, People are coming in and out of here like in that three semester period, and so it's it's really nice to be exposed to like a range of different things like every year, like as people come in and leave. I mean, I, uh, Padna, it's perhaps a different point of view. Um, I mean, um, when I first spoke to Dean, I was like, okay, first of all, uh, working for so many years, I I was scared whether I will lose my touch with the profession, just missing out and getting back to academics. But when I spoke to Dean, I was like, I was wanting to cram up more number of credits in like within one year. And he said, you know what, take a break. Like, take it slow, it's fine. <laughs> and I, I think he is one of the major factors where I would say uh, these three semesters bring a lot of uh, different, um, like next week we are traveling to San Francisco and uh, that sort of changes or uh, broadens our uh, vision towards what uh, American landscape is because we come from countries which are really cramped and not to put it down, but we do have other problems and the curriculum back in India is shaped really differently as against what it is in the United States here. Yeah. And so one of the agendas within the curriculum has also been to you know, bring a, a body of international students here to Austin, you know, find a way to create a really sort of multicultural mixture with American students, 
but then use the American city as the sort of core, um, let's call it research within the program, which is why we established a, a, a first semester program in Cascadia for a number of years. And the point of that is to overlap with landscape architecture and to teach jointly with students in landscape architecture. Because it is the agenda of the urban design program not to be in a silo and to really draw from the expertise and knowledge base of all the other programs in the school. And a lot of this uh, manifests itself through slightly more advanced research. So can you tell us a little bit about the current research you're doing and um, where, where you might go with it? Yeah, so um, talking about this semester, um, our studio is linked with uh, Gale Places and we are closely working with them on uh, this place in San Francisco called Richmond District. We just had a presentation today and I, I walked out of it <laughs> feeling a little, little guilty that I couldn't complete my presentation. But yeah, uh, having that, um, you know, the link with uh, uh, other firms and COVID sort of taught us how we can reach people from other cities and other states, even though they cannot be in person. I think that's what has made it so awesome being here. And yeah, I would let Brittany take over. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, since I'm in the dual degree program, I have the opportunity to do like a graduate thesis or a graduate project that works to combine like what I've learned in planning with what I've been learning in um, like the first ever studios that I've been taking as an urban designer. Um, and so I've gotten to work with um, like faculty from like architecture and then faculty from landscape. I've gotten to work with Dean. I've gotten to work with faculty from planning. And so it's, it's really cool to see how like all of these different fields come together uh, to like kind of help me generate my graduate project. Um, and so I focus a lot on designing for climate resiliency, um, but in a way that kind of captures the essence of humanity and what our role is in a natural ecosystem. Um, and so right now I'm working with um, Juan Moreau, who's a faculty in architecture, and he's been really influential in helping me like shape the spaces I want um, using what I've learned in my three years with the planning department. Um, and I've actually, um, it's actually a quote from, from you, Sinclair, um, in one of the recent publications that we have for a platform where you talked about how you have on the right um, planning and then way over on the left you have architecture and urban design kind of sits in the middle as this culmination point of the two. And I've like, been really fortunate to be able to explore like, this central focal point of all of those different fields. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's what we're up to. <laughs> and, and one last thing, which I think is very, very important, is that we are in the middle of the search for the first ever real urban design faculty member as a tenure track professor. And that will help us, hopefully, we'll get another one within another 20 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll get one in 10 years. Yeah. No, but we're really excited. We're going to start having uh, interviews for the new urban design faculty fairly soon in April. Um, uh, and they, we're doing one for interior design right now as well. It's a, inviting these people to come and talk is like the most amazing sort of like landscape of who's thinking about what uh, across the country and actually across the world on this. All right, we're gonna see that video now, the one we were supposed to kick off. It's supposed to get you all enthusiastic for the evening, so now it'll be all enthusiastic for cocktails, I think, yeah. What starts here changes the world. What starts here starts with you and a vision for what could be. For more than 100 years, 
The School of Architecture has shaped cities in Texas and around the world. Through the What Starts Here campaign, you can help educate tomorrow's leaders in design and planning, recruit and support outstanding faculty, elevate the school's research enterprise, and improve our buildings to transform teaching and learning in the next century. Your gift is an investment in our school, our students, and the buildings, cities, and communities we'll imagine together. Join us and change the world. today joining us this afternoon um, you know I, I and thank you all for speaking today I love these panels um, again I, I wish we had more more of our students and faculty out here to sort of hear what you all had to say it's like you know it's just uh, you guys just make me feel so honored uh, that I got to be in this amazing place with you um, be fruitful <laughs> Go out and enjoy yourselves. Thank you so much for being here and supporting us. Anything else, Luke, to add? Yeah. <laughs>